Hi, I'm Tyler Simpson. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a student of the Community, Environment, and Planning Program at the University of Washington. This is my senior project, uh, Limited Equity Housing Cooperatives Combating Displacement Through Collective Ownership. In the last decade, Seattle had an unprecedented growth in jobs and population driven by the tech industry. This influx of high-paid workers put tremendous pressure on the housing market and created kind of a cruel game of musical chairs that push people out of Seattle and out of housing altogether. Landlords and real estate investors have come to expect constantly increasing rents, squeezing people into vulnerable situations. The number of unhoused people in King County has risen to about 12,000, and while everyone's experience is unique, the common denominator is denial of a basic necessity on economic grounds. Everyone is deserving of housing, and without it, people die. In many cities, limited equity housing cooperatives historically created an urban commons that protects against the harms of speculative real estate and exploitative landlords. My research sought to answer what policies and financial infrastructure are necessary to spur cooperative social housing development in Seattle. For the past year, I've had conversations with leaders and stakeholders in affordable housing and cooperatives, have reviewed literature focused on DC and Canada and have analyzed housing market data in Seattle. Thinking about the pandemic right now, no one really knows what the housing crisis will look like in the near term. There are a lot of factors that affect housing costs and homelessness, including mass unemployment, uh, decreased population growth and Airbnb demand, a lack of new construction, and investors in disaster capitalism. Limited equity co-ops have a proven record on resilience, stability, and mutual aid throughout economic crisis and boom. Starting off with defining terms, what is a housing cooperative and how does that differ from a condominium? In a condominium, each resident owns their physical apartment space. In a cooperative, each resident owns a share of the nonprofit corporation that owns the building and the share grants them a unit. Seattle has several market rate cooperative buildings, but shares are not particularly cheap. A limited or zero equity cooperative makes this ownership model affordable in a few ways. The cooperative as a whole has a blanket mortgage which is often subsidized with low interest, government provided or insured loans. In both the US and Canada, most growth in LACs happened throughout programs in the 1970s as a result of both an interest in divesting from public housing by government and advocacy by unions and activists for cooperatives to be eligible uh, for subsidies of private housing. Residents in LACs pay a monthly housing charge that uh, covers the mortgage payments, utilities, and pays into a maintenance fund, all at cost. Residents democratically approve the budget each year and have complete transparency around operating costs. The value of the share is limited and not based on the equity gained by the mortgage payments, but often appreciates at a fixed rate or inflation. Share values in different LECs range anywhere from as low as $500 to as high as $40,000. Members participate in committees that manage all aspects of the building. LECs are not necessarily co-housing or an intentional community. There's a wide spectrum with some being very tight-knit and some even choosing to hire property management companies. At the creation of an LEC, the blanket mortgage will have the vast majority of the building's equity. Over time, mortgage payments um, grow the cooperative's organization's self-ownership, while the individual share values remain very small. Larger renovations as the building ages uh, will require taking on new debt. Academics such as Amanda Huron speaking about LACs like to call them the urban commons, thinking back to pre-capitalism. The commons implies a resource that is vital to our collective well-being and substance that is owned, managed, and used by the community. A commons embodies social relations based on democratic participation, interdependence, and cooperation. This concept of the urban commons challenges the theory of the tragedy of the commons, which uh, compares people to animal population biology in kind of a social Darwinist way uh, in order to justify privatization of all resources. The urban commons instead believes that democratic control over resources uh, will give everyone the incentive to maintain them. In practice, LEC members 
take care of their home and participate in their community for their time living there. Um, and because it is decommodified, it will serve future generations in the same affordable way. Stability, mobility, and liability are the key differences in the purported benefits and negatives of homeownership and renting. Contrasting these to the positives and negatives of blended equity co-ops, you have a mix that combines the stability uh, with most of the mobility of renting, uh, while liability is held collectively. There's an interdependent need to solve conflict and maintain the property, which is both a risk and an opportunity for mutual aid and support. It's a different bundle of rights than typically thought of as ownership in the U.S. Not to say that it's decolonization, but I think cooperatives do begin to confront the farce uh, that is settlers claiming ownership and profiting off of stolen land. Housing is a basic human need and right, and there's no reason homes should be compared with commodities in exchange value and exploited for passive income. Talking about affordable home ownership, there are often two incompatible goals brought up. One is maintaining permanent affordability so that future families will have access to that same resource that's been subsidized. And one is enabling wealth accumulation um, as a benefit that's historically been restricted only to white families. Uh, there is some criticism of LECs for continuing to deny that asset building power to residents of color. At the same time, homeowners of color were disproportionately foreclosed on in the 2009 financial crisis, while LECs maintain low foreclosure rates. LEC members frequently report being able to use that stability and affordability to invest in all parts of their life. Seattle is aiming to build 4,000 new units of affordable housing in the next two years. And we have nonprofits that do a lot of great work that I'm not trying to knock it off. It's a well-oiled machine that houses people. But we also have some private and for-profit companies that receive public subsidy to develop ostensibly affordable housing. Um, affordable housing is defined in the US as housing that's rent restricted to cost less than 30% of the income of a family at a specific income level, with the highest subsidized level being 80% of the area's median income, or AMI. The median income in Seattle has reached $113,000 this year for a family of four. Unlike public and voucher housing, in affordable housing, your rent is not based on your own income, it's based on the income cap of the unit. Um, if you don't make exactly the cap, then you're going to be rent burdened and paying more than 30% of your income on rent. While the median income has been rising rapidly in Seattle, a rising tide does not lift all boats. 23% of households in Seattle still earn below $40,000, which is not adequately served by any of the AMI levels targeted by most new construction affordable housing programs. Um, a full-time minimum wage worker would pay over half their income in a 60% AMI unit which are considered very low income units, yet they're only affordable for someone making over $50,000. While nonprofits have worked with the city to hold back on the rent increases that they're legally allowed to make, for-profit affordable housing landlords have not done the same. The multifamily tax exemption program in Seattle allows new construction housing to be exempt from property tax on the building for its first 12 years if the landlord restricts the rent to 20% of units being affordable to someone earning 80% of median income. There are about 5,000 of these MFT units across the city. The problem is 80% of AMI has reached so high that affordable units are not necessarily even cheaper than market rate units, even in the same building. The MFT program saves the landlord about $170 per unit per month, yet it's not generating rents any cheaper than what the market will bear. I talked with one MFT tenant that just had to fight her landlord who was trying to make an 11% rent increase even though all rent increases are currently illegal due to the emergency. On the more deeply subsidized side, Vintage Housing is one of the largest for-profit affordable housing developers in the US using the 30% low income housing tax credit, which covers about 30% of the construction of the building by reselling IRS tax credits, while the remainder of the cost is financed by subsidized low interest rates through tax-exempt bonds. 
This building opened in 2017 in West Seattle with one bedroom units renting for $960. Three years later, the rents are listed at $1,306. These are supposed to be deeply affordable units for very low income people after receiving massive subsidy from the US Treasury. Yet rents are still going up by $100 a year. With monthly charges based on actual cost and not a percentage of what the median income is, limited equity cooperatives prove more stable than um, affordable rental housing. Looking north, Canada's federal loan program, active between the early 70s and late 80s, developed about 100,000 units of new construction, zero equity cooperative housing. The program required some units be reserved for housing subsidy voucher holders, where the government covers any rent in excess of 30% of the resident's income. This model allows an income mixer from extremely low income to middle working class families. I combed through the websites of 22 cooperatives in Vancouver that have publicly listed recent figures for their housing costs, and I found monthly charges were three-eighths of what uh, market rate rent listings are uh, for most unit sizes, with three bedrooms costing just $1,300 per month. Charges average being just about affordable for minimum wage workers, um, with the number of earners expected in each unit. One of the key factors in the success of cooperatives in Canada is the Cooperative Housing Federation. The nonprofit is itself a co-op of independent housing co-ops and serves all of them to provide technical support, communication, homeowners insurance, and lobbying power with local offices and regional partner organizations. UHAB fills a similar role in New York but there's no equivalent organization with the same level of national infrastructure in the U.S. Homesite is an organization that's historically built single-family houses for affordable home ownership. They're now hoping to begin construction on a 68-unit limited equity cooperative at the Othello Light Rail Station in Seattle. Share prices will be about $25,000, which can be individually financed through a partnership with Verity Credit Union who's even made their loans Sharia law compliant. The affordability uh, will initially target an income range of 65 to 80 percent of area median income. Housing charges will remain stable, so as the building ages and inflation occurs, it will be able to accommodate relatively lower income brackets. Homesite received financing from the City of Seattle, King County, and the State Housing Trust Fund. This project has a lot of attention on it as sort of a prototype. Homesite's development director, Uche Okezi, told me that this model feels like uh, kind of the future of the organization with their traditional townhouses too expensive due to land cost. Moving to the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act in Washington, D.C., or TOPA. This legislation requires that landlords wanting to sell their building must first offer it to the tenants. The tenants have 45 days to form an association and express their interest followed by 120 days to finalize their offer. The city department provides both technical aid and subsidized financing. LECs make up many, but not all of the resulting ownership structures after the TOPA process. Tenants controversially have the ability to sell their TOPA rights to a third party buyer, which can even be a private landlord that will use the delay to get a lower price. This results in relocation buyouts as high as $50,000. Back in 2018, local media took up the mom-and-pop landlords calling TOPA extortion or even a hostage situation, and in response, the city council excluded tenants in single-family houses and duplexes from having TOPA rights. This is despite many single-family rentals um, being owned by corporate landlords. It's important to know the context that TOPA was able to pass in. DC became majority black by 1957. All the way up to 1975, it was run by a um, kind of totalitarian congressional committee with segregationist and Klansmen members. There was no local democracy accountable for the interests of DC residents. After getting a city council and mayor, gentrification quickly ramped up. A condominium conversion crisis occurred, uh, where mostly black uh, families were displaced from rental apartments so that they could be renovated and sold as property to white families moving into uh, DC. Activists fought for TOPA and were able to get it passed through the city council in 1977. 
In just the first two years, tenant organizers succeeded in preserving 6,000 homes as affordable LECs. Limited equity housing cooperatives have a proven track record of enacting housing justice and protecting low-income communities from gentrification. With housing stability, one of the biggest stressors in people's lives is removed and they're able to focus that energy in so many other ways. Amanda Huron's research found LEC residents described using that stability on all kinds of opportunities, including pursuing more meaningful work at a pay cut, going back to school, or spending money on opportunities for their children. AMI-based rental restrictions do not provide that. The same subsidies that these for-profit affordable housing developers take advantage of have been used by cooperatives in the past and could still be available for new cooperatives to use. There are efforts in many Californian cities to pass TOPA, and this crisis might just prove the right timing. Landlords are feeling very uncertain about future rents and real estate investment as a whole. The main obstacle I found was not necessarily policy, but organizational capacity. Hopefully the success of the Homesite project will bring new efforts to create the urban commons.